Good afternoon, everyone. I'm your host, Chris Flynn, and today I'm talking to Corey Doctorow. Before we start, we've got a few uh, housekeeping things, of course. Please turn your phones to silent um, option. If you're tweeting, it's hashtag ADLWW. <laughs> um, let's take our own advice there. Yep. Um, the book signing, Corey, Corey will be signing books at the end over near the book tent, and the bar is open until 7 o'clock. It's the one thing I always remember as an Irishman. Um, the, we would like to acknowledge that the land we meet on today is the traditional land for the um, Garner people and that we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. We also acknowledge uh, the Garner people as the custodians of the Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage and beliefs are still as important to the living Garner people today. Now, Corey is the edit co-editor of Boing Boing. He's an activist, a journalist, author of Ten novels. That's the correct. I don't know the number, but it's about twenty something books. Twenty two or twenty three books. Right. Let's just skip to that. Uh, twenty two, twenty three books. Um, two thousand fourteen. He published Information Doesn't Want to Be Free: Laws for the Internet Age, in which he sets out the essential ground rules to assist us with the future of technology. And last year saw the release of his latest novel, Walk Away which is a, a dense and really exciting story outlining how technology can be embraced in order to create a utopia or abused with the opposite result. He is one of the most important and visionary science fiction writers in the world today. So please give a warm round of applause to Cory Doctorow. Cory, welcome to Adelaide, the Australian utopia. Yeah, I, I've had a lovely time. It's my last night here. I'm off to Wellington in the morning, but it's been a, a really superb uh, several days. And I'm, I'm told that uh, Adelaide gets the best of all worlds, where for about a month it, it has the cultural life of the largest cities in the world, and the other 11 months of the year you can get a parking spot. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got a lot to get through, so maybe let's get straight into Walk Away. Um, the 1% has become the 0.1%, and rather than put up with it, people are starting to rebel. Um, can you set the scene for us and maybe give us a bit of a brief reading? Yeah, sure, uh, if I could borrow your copy here. So it's the idea is that, um, as, the, uh, as I say, the precariat becomes the unnecessariat. So rather than being barely, barely hanging in there uh, in the economic realm and at least moderately useful to the overall economic picture because the fact that you are desperate for a job means that other people won't ask for higher wages. Uh, though we, we have enough people doing that now and most of us have become surplus to requirements because we decided the robots could do everyone's job but the dividends of that robot efficiency should accrue only to people who own robots <laughs> and not to people who used to do their jobs. And the walkaways move off to blighted brownfield sites that are the uh, remainders of environmental catastrophes uh, and they build uh, fully automated luxury uh, hotels, theme parks, uh, resorts that anyone can move into and use and that kind of self-maintain uh, and they dedicate themselves to leisure and since there is enough uh, greenfields, uh, brownfield sites and enough garbage out there to build as many of these as you could possibly want if some uh, weirdo gets it into their head that they want to uh, enforce their property rights over the garbage and the blighted land that you're occupying, you just shrug and walk away and do it again on the next patch. Uh, that's all going very well until um, practical immortality is invented and then uh, shortly thereafter stolen and published for wide consumption. And at that point, the super rich start to understand that they may have to spend all of eternity with us and that's when they start bombing. <laughs> so I'm gonna read a little bit from chapter two. Uh, this is called You All Meet in a Tavern. And for those of you with uh, younger people in tow, this has the F word in it. If they didn't know that there was an F word, they will shortly. <laughs> Saturdays at the Belt and Braces were the busiest and there was always competition for the best jobs. The first person through the door hit the light and checked the infographics. These were easy enough to read that anyone could make sense of them, even a noob. But Limpopo was no noob. She had more commits into the Belt and Braces firmware than anyone, an order of magnitude lead over the rest. It was technically in poor taste for her to count her commits, let alone keep a tally. In a gift economy, you gave without keeping score, because keeping score employed an, implied an expectation of reward. And if you're doing something with the expectation of a reward, it's an investment and not a gift. 
In theory, Limpopo agreed. In practice, it was so easy to keep score, and the leaderboard was so satisfying that she just couldn't help herself. She wasn't proud of this, mostly. But this Saturday, this Sunday, first at the door of the belt and braces, alone in the big common room with its aligned rows of tables and chairs, all the infographics showing nominal, she felt proud. She patted the wall with a perverse, unacceptable, proprietary air. She'd helped build the belt and braces, scavenging the Badlands for the parts its drone outriders that identified for its construction. It was the project she'd found her walk away with, the thing uppermost in her mind when she'd looked around the Badlands, set down her pack, emptied her pockets of anything worth stealing, put extra underwear in a bag, and walked out into the Niagara Escarpment, past the invisible line that separated civilization from no man's land, out of the world as it was, and into the world as it could be. The code base had originated with the UN High Commission on Refugees and had been field trialed a lot. You told it the kind of building you wanted, gave it a scavenging range, and it directed its drones to inventory anything nearby, scanning multi-band, doing deep database scrapes against urban planning and building code sources to identify usable blocks for whatever it was you were trying to make. This turned into a scavenger hunt inventory, and the refugees or aid workers, or in shameful incidents that trafficked juvenile slaves, fanned out across the world to retrieve the pieces the building needed to conjure itself into existence. These flowed onto the job site. The building tracked and configured them a continuously refactored critical path for its build plan that factored in the skill levels of the humans or the robots on site at any given moment. The effect was something like magic and something like ritual humiliation. If you installed something wrong, the system tried to find a way to work around your stupid mistake. Failing that, the system buzzed your haptics with rising intensity, and if you ignored them, it tried optical, even audible, and if you squelched that, it started telling the other humans that something was amiss, and instructed them to come and fix it. There'd been a lot of A-B splitting of this. You could see it in the code base and the field trials, and the most successful strategy the buildings had found for correcting humans was to pretend that they didn't exist. So, if you planted a piece of structural steel in a way that the building really couldn't work with and ignored that rising chorus of warnings, someone would be told that there was a piece of misaligned material and tasked to it with high urgency. It was the same error that the buildings generated if something slipped. It didn't assume that a human being had fucked up through malice or incompetence. The initial theory had been that an error without a responsible party would be more socially graceful. After all, people double down on their mistakes, especially if you embarrass them in front of their peers. The name and shame alternate versions had shown that hot-cheeked fierce denial was the biggest impediment to standing up any building. So, if you fucked up, soon someone would turn up with a mecha, or a forklift, or a screwdriver, and a job ticket to unfuck that thing that you were percussively maintaining into submission. You could pretend that you were doing the same job as the new guy, you were part of the solution instead of the problem's cause. This let you save face so that you wouldn't insist that you were doing it right and the building stupid instructions and everything else in the universe was wrong. Reality was chewily weirder in a way that Limpopo loved. It turned out that if you were dispatched to defubar something and you found someone who's the obvious source of that infubarage, you could completely tell that structural steel was not, wasn't not three degrees off true because of slippage. It was three degrees off true because some dipshit just loved it. What's more, Senor Dipshit knew that you knew that he was at fault, but the fact that the trouble ticket read urgent re true structural member minus three degrees at 120 degrees north northeast and not urgent re-true structural member minus three degrees at 120 degrees north northeast because some dipshit can't follow instructions, let both of you do this mannered kabuki in which you operated in the third person passive voice. The beam has become off true, not you fucked up that beam. <laughs> this pretense, the researchers called it networked social disattention, everyone else called it the how did that get there effect had marked a vital shift in the UNHCR's distributed shelter initiative. Prior to that, it had all been gamified to fuckery, with leaderboards for the most correct installs and the best looters. Test bills were marred by angry confrontations and fistfights. 
Even this could be a virtue, since every building would fissure into two or three subgroups putting up their own buildings. It was three for the price of one. Inevitably, though, these forked off projects would be less ambitious than the original one, and so those early sites had a characteristic look. A wide, flat building, the first three stories of something that had been intended for ten before half the workers had quit. And then a hundred meters away, three more buildings, each half the size of the first, representing the forked and reforked buildings revenge built by alienated splitters. Some sites had Fibonacci spirals of ever smaller buildings terminating in a single hostility radiating hate built Wendy house. <laughs> Thank you. I just love how the technology wearily manages the humans. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it, it's it's funny, but um, Ronald Coase won the Nader Nobel Prize in Economics in 1937 for a paper called The Theory of the Firm that was about this idea that um, the, the way that we should evaluate institutions was by how they coordinated our labor, not by why they coordinated it. That, it the, that, that methodologies used to make sure that the person knitting the sweater wasn't sitting next to someone who was unraveling it is much more important than what they were actually trying to make, be they the Catholic Church or the government of Australia or the Mafia or ISIS or you know AOL. That, that it's how they coordinate, not why, that really matters. And coordination, it's the ancient project of our species, right? You know, when you when you look at like the very thin evidence we have about what behavioral modern hominids were doing in the early days, the one thing we're relatively certain of is they were starting to form groups. We we have evidence of those groups, and we have evidence of that cooperation both in the archaeological record and in the neurological record, right? That new bark, the neocortex, the, the most recent addition to our brains, uh, is the thing that functionally mostly functions to uh, navigate our social relationships, to figure out who you might trust to watch the kids for, and make sure the tigers didn't eat them and who can go and be trusted to go and collect the fruit. That allows you to be superhuman, right? To literally do more than one human could do. And the thing that the internet has done is it's lowered and lowered and lowered without any bottom in sight the cost of organizing people to do a project together. And what that means is you have you don't need as much common cause to come together to do something because you can find out on the way whether or not you're all there for the same reason. And if you're not, you put so little effort into it that you can just fissure apart. You know, one of the great criticisms that has been floated of things like Occupy is that they never articulated an ideology. One of the problems about articulating an ideology is you have to decide who's in and who's out. But if you just say, look, I think we're all going to the same place, or at least most of the way to the same place, why don't we all march together until some of us need to peel off? Then you can build a very big tent and get a lot of people underneath it. I think that's the first time I've ever heard the Australian government, the mafia, ISIS, and AOL mentioned in the same sentence. <laughs> you haven't been listening to the Cardinal Pell trials. <laughs> One of the things I love about your books, especially this one, is that um, they feel like they could take place tomorrow, but I assume the frightening thing is that a lot of the tech already exists today. Are you constantly keeping an eye out for technological developments? You know, I don't worry much about being overtaken by events. I actually think that um, the thing that marks a kind of break in science fiction uh, literary conventions in the last 15 years or so is the emerging uh, presence of writers who deal with computers not as narrative conveniences, but as they are in theory. Uh, and so rather than just saying, well, let's we have a computer and it can do whatever the plot demands of it. Instead, they say, let us take a computer and its actual constraints and capabilities and see what narrative possibilities fall out of those real world capabilities and possibilities. And one of the um, poorly understood but very significant things about the underlying technological reality of computers is that they are what's called Turing complete. It's named for Alan Turing. And Turing said that we could build a computer that could run every program. If you can express a program in symbolic logic, we could build a program that could run it, or a computer that could run it. And what that means is that all of the computers from the very earliest code-breaking computers of the war effort up until now are in some important functional sense the same. They can all run all the same programs. And so what that means is that if you have a need to improve a computer so that it can be better at flying a jet, or controlling a pacemaker, or uh, throwing birds at pigs, that whatever incremental improvement you make to that computer, that ripples out to all of those other domains. 
And so by the same token, anything you do to regulate a computer has implications for all those domains. This is why you should all be just scared shitless that Malcolm Turnbull said, uh, apropos of whether or not the Australian government should ban working cryptography, uh, I don't know about the laws of mathematics, but I assure you in Australia, the laws of Australia are the laws of Australia, so the mathematicians be hanged. And the thing is, that cryptography is not just used to let terrorists communicate in secret, it's also used to make sure that if someone sends a software update to your pacemaker, it's not something that can kill you in 100 yards. Uh, and, you know, it's such a great difference to this that it should really frighten you. But in terms of um, writing science fiction that has longevity, the thing that you get from attending to computers as they are is that the problems of computers are in some sense eternal, right? Because the actual underlying theory of computers is not moving very quickly. The, the speed at which they run, the engineering of making them is changing, but like the theory of computing is pretty stable. And so any problems you allegorize in your fiction today will still be allegories for problems we're having in 10 years. What you one of the interesting things about information doesn't want to be free. We're going to jump around a little bit between the books here, perhaps, um, as these points come up. Is uh, the idea of omnipresent surveillance is frequently mentioned in your in your novels, and in, in, in information doesn't want to be free. You expand a bit on spyware, and one of the alarming things that I um, took from it was um, how that can be installed in a variety of devices that basically have microchips in them. Um, how monitored are we through devices that we would never? suspect to be monitored by? It's a really good question. So on the one hand, you have um, things like your browsers leaking a lot of information you probably don't suspect. Uh, I heartily recommend downloading a free extension from Electronic Frontier Foundation called Privacy Badger that just gives you some insight when you land on a page as to what information is being collected about you from by the, the proprietors of that website. But on the other hand, you have this, what you might think of as a surveillance debt. So you have all these systems that are uh, either accumulating information on you and sending it back to a company to mine later. Uh, a lot of times firms speculatively collect data on their users because they're not really sure how they're gonna make money and one of the ways that they might be able to make money someday is by flogging off that data. Right. Um, and and uh, you have these devices that are therefore configured out of the box to be as surveillance as possible. And so you have the data piling up in the, in the warehouses of these you know, badly managed startups that have no adult supervision and nine out of 10 of them are gonna go belly up inside of two years and you know, their assets will be sold off to the, to the highest bidder at auction. And on the other hand, you have these devices which if they're compromised, have the ability to spy on you or designed to spy on you, right? To be as, as surveillant as possible. And then uh, on the third hand, you have the cumulative nature of breaches where it may be that a bunch of data ruptures from vendor A that can't be used to identify you, but that does identify someone, who might be anyone in the world, who's done a bunch of things, some of which is compromising, and then vendor B leaks their data, and it's the key that you use to put names to all of those anonymized people in vendor A's data breach. And so, you know, you get a breach of, say, the, um, uh, a bunch of health records, that tell you who got prescribed which medicine and which hospital where, but with no names attached. And then you get a breach of Uber, and it tells you who took a cab to the hospital that day. And with that merge, you can suddenly make sense of a bunch of records that were previously relatively denatured, right? Sort of decaffeinated. But you put them together, and all of a sudden they have this, this uh, 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 supercharged effect in terms of their ability to compromise you. Um, thinking about some of the specific tech, maybe in, in, in Walk Away, um, the book begins at a party in a factory where young entrepreneurs are, are sort of repurposed the production line to make beds. Can you tell us a bit about the share economy that exists in this world and maybe give us some real world examples of how that's actually sure. happening now? So the, the, it opens with these, these kids breaking into an old Muji factory, you know, Muji, the Japanese yeah. flat pack company. Um, and uh, they, they have what they call a communist party. They say it doesn't make them communists any more than going to birthday parties makes you a birthdayist. It's a thing you do, not, a, not an ideology you subscribe to. Uh, but in a communist party, everyone wears Marx glasses, not the kind with the big nose and the thick frames, but the kind with the big beard. And you, uh, you, you drink transgenic beer that, uh, that uses uh, microbes that 
turns ditch water into, into beer and that lives on in your urine briefly so that you can turn the urine back into beer if you want to. <laughs> and, um, and you light up a factory that has been shut down, that, that was deemed because of a spreadsheet to no longer be viable even if people still need its products. And you get it running again and you give the products away for as long as you can. And this Muji factory has been shut down not because people don't want Muji beds, but because of the financial engineering that goes into uh, the factory siting and operation. So they've been given in the novel a tax holiday to operate in Ontario, it's a province in Canada, uh, for a few years and then the tax holiday expires. A lot of jurisdictions offer these tax holidays in the hopes that once the holiday expires the firm will stay on and start being a tax paying member of the society. So uh, instead, Muji has decided to just pack up and go. And, and Muji in this world has adopted the same licensing regime that we already see today with um, firms like Rolex and Cartier. So if you're Rolex, your holding company is registered in a tax haven in uh, the Virgin Islands or in Panama, and um, it owns all of your trademarks and designs and then it licenses them to sister companies in every jurisdiction, like Rolex Australia, Rolex US, Rolex uh, UK, and so on. And they manufacture a Rolex watch under license, and they're the only people licensed to manufacture something trademarked Rolex in that territory. If you take a watch that is licensed, that was manufactured by the licensor in America to Australia, it becomes a counterfeit because you are not allowed, the only watches that are allowed to be sold under the Rolex trademark in Australia were manufactured by the company that uh, has the trademark in Australia. And so Muji has done this, they've withdrawn the trademark from this factory. And by withdrawing the trademark, the factory becomes inert, right? It's no longer a factory that can manufacture beds. And so they just rock up and turn everything on again, right? They have a rave, they drink their weird beer, they make beds for everyone, and they see how long they can make a go of it. And who's trying to stop these people from forming an egalitarian society? Why would anyone want to stop them? Well, so to the extent that what they're doing is nicking stuff off of other people that they think of as their property, uh, there's loads of people who have a stake in stopping it. So on the one hand, you get the people who consider it their property, and in shareholder capitalism, that might be a very large number of people, all the institutional shareholders and their sub-shareholders and so on. Um, but you also have the people who have a stake, if not a share, right? The people who want to make sure that no one does, the, does this to them later. And they all kind of get together, you know, we, we, they, 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 it's a sort of uh, perverse solidarity of, this, of the investor class. Um, but by and large, as these people move out of the, the, uh, the real world and into the, this demimond, these, these blighted sites, they're, lo they're tolerated. They become a kind of adorable bohemia in the same way that, you know, people who on the, their day jobs might be working for firms that are really very serious about getting TPP passed to make sure that no one can counterfeit anything, still go on a holiday to Thailand and bring back, you know, Sobe, watch, uh, Sobe uh, electronics and uh, Cartier watches and, and, you know, adorable counterfeits that are, that are sort of fun and, 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 and frivolous and, and, and cute and kind of, and, and kind of dangerously uh, subcultural. Um, but, you know, living in that subculture, you know, heroin chic only lasts until, like, someone declares a war on drugs. And then heroin chic ceases to be chic anymore, and the bohemia becomes too dangerous to live. And that's one of the patterns of bohemia, right? It either gets co-opted or it becomes beyond the pale. Do you think that um, working together for mutual benefit is still hardwired into us, or has it been replaced by a more selfish sort of doomsday prep instinct? So I think that um, we are none of us good or bad, but that we're all flawed vessels, that there are parts of our nature that are noble and that know that the optimal thing to do in respect to the people around you is to be to live by the golden rule, to be nice to people, to treat, as, to treat others as you'd like to be treated. And then there's a part of you that's short-tempered or that is anxious or that is just uh, not paying close enough attention to give people the kindness that we want, that they, that they deserve, that we would like to think we'd give them. And a lot of that is dictated, which, which nature is expressed is dictated by circumstance. You know, if you're panicked, if you think that uh, the, the dollar in benefits that your neighbor gets is a dollar that you won't get when you retire on your inadequate pension, then you start to quite resent your, your, your neighbor's uh, benefits. But on the other hand, if you think that there's enough to go around, 
or if you believe that your neighbor having been nursed back to help through the benefit system will stand up for you, then it makes sense for you to, to feel uh, good about what they're doing. I think we've been engaged in a 40-year project to make civilization feel like a game of musical chairs, where the, the prosperity that was uh, broadly shared in the post-war era, is has, we, we're told that it cannot be sustained. And it becomes a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy in that the uh, uh, certainty that someone out there is going to get more than you, and that that's not only going to mean that they have more than you, but that you'll have less than you could possibly s survive on, Makes, makes all of us into a, a kind of greedy hoarder. Uh, and um, I, I don't think that that's permanent. I think that, that's a, that it's a blip in our, the long sweep of our history and, and how we think about other people. And I think that one of the most amazing things is that in times of crisis, we don't uh, turn into kind of venal, uh, uh, you know, post-apocalyptic Mad Max extras that the, the lived reality of people who've been in disasters, uh, the 2002 tsunami, or Fukushima, or the Haiti quake, or the Christchurch quake, is that when the ground shakes, or when the building burns down, or when the tsunami hits, that's the moment when you run to your neighbor's aid. It's the moment where all that other stuff stops seeming nearly so important, and you realize that you do have this shared destiny with the people around you, and I was very much inspired when I wrote this book, as I mentioned yesterday on my panel, by a book by Rebecca Solnit called A Paradise Built in Hell, which is a, a, a historical book that draws on first-person contemporaneous accounts of life after disasters to describe that foundational goodness in us. And really, you know, when you think about it, there's a kind of innumeracy to the belief that other people are all bastards. Because you're, you probably don't think of yourself as a total bastard, and you probably think that most of the people you know are total bastards. And what are the odds that if 99.9% .9 of us are total bastards, that you and everyone you know just happen not to be among that 99.9%? That .9%? Isn't it much more likely that you and everyone you know are a broadly representative slice of humanity and you have your good days and your bad days, and your project isn't to locate people who are good, but to find the ways to make the good in all of us come to the fore? I must admit that. I must admit, I wonder if you have done this too. I, I, my friends and I have occasionally talked about what we would do if it all goes south and where we would go and uh -huh. how we would get in touch with each other and who might try to prevent us from doing that and how we would handle that. Well, look, I mean, you know, I, the, the, the fantasy of running for the hills is, is adorable, but, you know, the reality is that, like, without a working sewage system, we're all going to die of cholera. <laughs> and so civilization is not going to be rebuilt by the people who hide out in the hills, cowardly, you know, hunkered down with their tin goods. It's going to be uh, rebu rebuilt, rebooted by the people who run for the middle of town and get the sewage system running again. Uh, and, you know, if you come back down out of the hills uh, with your rugged individualism intact, to then free ride on the collectivist labor of the people who got the sewage system running again. I only hope that you have the self-awareness to understand that the rich irony of that situation. Yeah, it's funny how in all those dystopian TV shows like The Walking Dead, no one ever goes to the bathroom. It's never yeah, <laughs> yeah, really. It's never discussed. Um, one of the other um, things that I love about this book is it sort of posits the benefits of a uh, Skillshare system that solves huge human problems. Uh, in particular, one, well, it's arguably a problem, death. Um, can you tell us a bit about how that is dealt with in the book? Yeah, I talked about this a little yesterday, so apologies for those of you who are hearing it twice, but um, they, the, there's a kind of recurring theme in contemporary science fiction about people uploading their brains into computers. Mm -hmm. I, I think that it's a lovely metaphor. I, I don't think it's a practical project in any way, but, but it, I stipulate that maybe they've invented this and that the real problem will be that after you've got your brain to wake up in a computer, that it, it, it might be distressed to discover that it's dead uh, and that it is going to spend the rest of its life as a software construct and immediately commit suicide. Um, but these people, they have very, very powerful computers and they can explore the space of all the thoughts that a simulated you might have, even the least probable ones, because I think we're all probabilistic, none of us are deterministic. In a given situation, there are many thoughts that you might have, and you've probably experienced 
Uh, I, I think you certainly, all of us have certainly experienced having a thought and thinking, that's a very odd thought for me to have thought, right? So even within the realm of like, uh, all the thoughts we might have, you have a kind of normal distribution where you have six sigma thoughts that are really out of the norm, but that are things that your brain might generate in, a, in, a, in, in, in the real world. And what the software does is it tries to think among all the thoughts that you might think next, which one is least likely to trigger an existential catastrophe for you. And so it thinks that thought, and then it looks ahead one more step and another. And I actually stole this from a, a wonderful Australian writer named Greg Egan, who lives out in Perth. And uh, Egan's first novel, Quarantine, supposes that there might be a technology that lets us choose which of the many worlds that quantum mechanics says we live among, we, we inhabit. And so, you know, again, if you think about all the things that might happen in the world, if you were put in jail, there's, a, there's one world, at least a, a non-zero chance that the jailers might forget to lock the door. So if you were put in jail and you could choose which of the many worlds you went into, assuming all things happen and a new universe is forked off for every possibility, you could just be in the world in which the jailers forgot to lock the door, and also in the world in which they conveniently left a pile of money and a change of clothes, and where the CCTVs have stopped working, and so on, right? And, and so that idea that like you can thread your way among all the possibilities, no matter how implausible, kind of inverse shakes, uh, 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 Sherlock Holmes, a notion when you eliminate the impossible, whatever, whatever remains how improbable must be the, the truth, that you can thread your way among these infinitely improbable worlds. And this Douglas Adams idea, the infinite improbability drive, realized as a way of simulating consciousness, was really fun to work with. And the characters uh, who are simulated in software, they reach, um, they, they start to make copies of themselves. They, they can have hundreds of themselves in different places doing different jobs. And among the jobs that they do is they, they become the last person out in besieged walkaway settlements that are about to be blown up or burned down or destroyed by, by the forces of reaction. And just as it's about to all end, they take the bumpers off their consciousness and they have that, that beautiful existential crisis they've been keeping at bay since they were first instantiated in software as a kind of recreational drug. And then they capture it and they send it off to all the other instances of themselves so they can all Kind of experience it, but secondhand, uh, like a like a recording of you know your your kamikaze flight or 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 Slim Pickens at the end of uh, of Doctor Strangelove riding the nuke and waving his hat in the air. But the more iterations of you that exist, um, the smarter you become, and in the end, you sort of become God in a way. I don't know that these characters ever become godlike. They certainly be, be have a lot of knowledge, but not necessarily a lot of wisdom. And in fact, one of the things I play with is that um, people who in life were uh, in love with one another and really soulmates, as software constructs find that they don't like each other very much after a while. <laughs> and they have this they have this, um, this kind of conundrum where they, they ask themselves and the people around them ask themselves, uh, does this mean that they're not a faithful copy? Or are they one of those couples that if they've lived long enough would have divorced? And they, there's really no way to know. Um, and, and if you believe that um, any couple might come to an impasse where they might divorce provided that they were dumb enough about the disputes that they had and how they settled them, then, then perhaps there's no way to answer it at all. Uh, and you know, they, be, they, they end up thinking of themselves as very uh, foolish, uh, I think, and, and not infinitely wise. Um, and then especially, when uh, one of the per people who's been presumed dead and has been revived in software is turned out to have been rendered to a secret prison for a decade and a half, and still alive, and alarmed to discover that her friends had considered her dead and had been running a software version of her for a decade and a half, and she probably falls in love with the software version of her ex-boyfriend, whom her software version of herself has no time for. <laughs> <laughs> so, in the, in the balance of using technology for the benefit of everyone versus using technology as a means of control and perpetuating uh, hierarchies. Where do you think we currently stand? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I like to think in my theory of change that there's such a thing as peak indifference. So it's the moment at which the number of people who have either first-hand experience or close second-hand experience of the consequences of bad choices that, are, that have been able to go on for a long time because those consequences happen a long way away from the choice, that that number of people reaches a tipping point and it only goes up, 
right? The number of people who actually acknowledge that we really do have a problem, say, with the climate, only goes up after a certain point. And we're in a race between this this point of, uh, of peak indifference, when the number of people you can easily recruit to do something goes up, uh, and the peak point of no return, when it doesn't matter how many people you recruit to your side, it's too late, you know, we've, we've, we've uh, carbonized too much of our atmosphere, or, or we've embedded too much bad software and bad business practice in our digital world. And I think right now it's pretty bad, but the thing I hope to salvage from this bad situation, you know, life gives you SARS, you make SARS Morello. You know, the thing I hope to salvage is that at least if we're in a situation in which everyone around us is suffering from our bad technology policy choices, we can at least recruit them to the cause of trying to make our technology choices better. And not because I think technology is a good in and of itself, right? Like I think climate justice, justice related to uh, 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 decolonization and indigenous land claims, justice related to gender and race and, and uh, gender uh, identity and expression and, and, and all of the other problems that we have are far more important than the problems we have with the internet. But I think the internet is more foundational than those because the, the internet is the terrain on which we'll fight those battles. And without a free, fair, and open internet infrastructure, we can't win those much more important, much more significant battles. And um, you know th that's why I've sort of dedicated myself to keeping the internet free, fair, and open, or making it free, fair, and open. Uh, not because I, I, I think of technology as a good in and of itself, but because we need solid ground on which to, to stand and fight. Yeah. It's well timed, that point, too, because net neutrality has been in the news, obviously, quite a lot lately. Um, but for those who don't maybe don't know what it is, what is it and why should we care about it? Yeah, you know, the fact that we're debating it is like, it's a very weird science fictional thing because it's, a, it's, an, a, a, it's the very abstruse intersection of telecoms policy and competition policy, okay. which are themselves both super wonky, nerdy, fringe pursuits. And then like the people who care about both of them isn't so much like a Venn overlap as like a Venn sphincter. And <laughs> Yet, you know, this idea has got like 87% approval in the, in the US where they've just demolished it, uh, which is a thing I never would have bet on. So the idea of net neutrality is that you buy an internet connection from a telecoms provider, and that in a neutral internet, when you click on a link or do something else to request something over the internet, they go and get it as efficiently as they can and give it, give it to you. In a network discrimination world, they go to the people who provide the services whose links you're clicking on, whose data you're requesting, and they say, if you don't pay us a bribe, we will slow down your connection uh, when your customers try to get data or other services from you, and it will make your competitors' connections better by comparison. And we're gonna sell the fastest speed to connect to the users to the highest bidder. And it seems to me pretty facially obvious that this is not a customer-friendly way to run a network. You know, one of the things that economists, especially neoliberal economists, really concern themselves with is choice theory. What do consumers really want? Well, like, in the case of the internet, there is absolutely no question which data you want. It's the link you clicked on, right? Like, there's no ambiguity about whether or not you want to watch a YouTube video if you just requested a YouTube video. And so if we're going to create a telecoms policy that serves what people want, it is blindingly obvious to anyone who hasn't been bribed by a telecoms operator that telecoms operators should give you the stuff you asked for. Nobody bought internet service to get the things that were most profitable to the telecoms operator's shareholders. We bought it to get the stuff we wanted. And the telecoms operators say, we own the network infrastructure, we pay for it, if you don't like it, get network infrastructure from someone else. But that's not really how telecoms works, right? The way telecoms works is, if you wanna go into a city like Adelaide or even a much bigger city like Sydney, or if you wanna run uh, uh, transcontinental lines that go from, say, Adelaide to Perth, you don't go around with a kind of army of uh, business development, property developers, uh, asking people what they would charge to rent out a square meter of their front lawn to stick a telephone pole or to dig up the sidewalk in front of their house. You go to cities and you go to countries and you go to state governments and you ask for rights of way because the clearing cost of digging up every street of every city 
of every country runs to the tens of trillions of dollars. And you would never ever run a profitable telecom unless you got that public subsidy. And when you take the king's shilling, you owe a duty to the king. When you take a public subsidy, you have to run your network in the public interest. And if you don't want the public subsidy, by all means, go galt. Go to your shareholders, ask them for $10 trillion, and start digging up sidewalks. And you can do whatever the hell you want on that internet. But if our cities are going to give you the exclusive franchise to use our dirt, then you damn well better run the connections in that dirt that we need, not the ones that your shareholders wish we'd use. I'm sure that strikes a chord with, with many people here because of our, I'm sure you're aware of our current uh, national broadband network and its ongoing... Oh, situation. no, I never heard... It's, it's not just going well with that. I, I <laughs> yeah, it's not around my way yet, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm ever going to get it to my house or just to the curb outside and then I have to pay someone else to get it from the curb to my house. Oh, yeah. I'm very, I, live, I just bought a house in Burbank, which is a little city on the edge of Los Angeles. And uh, our cable uh, monopoly did a deal with the city where the city's allowed to put fiber in, but they're not allowed to terminate it in any premises that isn't zoned commercial. So even though I have a registered business in my home, and even though there is a piece of gigabit fiber optic that serves Disney and uh, uh, Warners and is unbelievably fast and robust, no one will terminate it in my house. I get 20 megabit per second cable that goes out at five o'clock every day and not the data that's flowing through that piece of glass that's underneath the concrete slab of my house. Do you think people will take a bit of heart from walk away though and start making that little extra connection themselves? Well, I, I like to think that um, if you can show people that it's not inevitable, the way that we live, that the sense that there are other possibilities is the thing that's really important. Not a prescription for which future we should have, but the fact that more than one future is possible. You know, I, I think that like the greatest rhetorical trick that Margaret Thatcher ever played was when she said there is no alternative. Because what she did was she disguised a demand as an observation, right? When, when she said there is no alternative to the way that we're running things now, what she meant is by all means, stop trying to think of any alternatives, <laughs> right? Just the act of imagining that there is a different way to do things empowers you to start experimenting with stuff that you thought was immovable. Um, and, you know, I think that change happens like an avalanche a little bit at first and then all at once, that that you get these people who start to, in, in places all around the world, who start to think about how things might be different, who start to look over one another's shoulders and see the existence proof of things being different. And then before you know it, they start to cohere around the idea of trying something new. Uh, it's it's pretty marvelous. I. I it, I am, if not optimistic, at least hopeful, that there are better futures that are possible for us. I guess people have always found ways to subvert the rules with technology, haven't they? Because even just thinking, when, whenever cable first came in and people were hooking up to their neighbor's cable and finding ways to um, sure. not buy into the, the prescribed way of, uh, of, of, of delivering technology. Yeah, and you know, we tend to focus on like the most uh, visible expression of that, which is the stuff where someone's doing something that really upsets the cable operator. But the reality is that like every time you get a tool, if you use it a lot, what you start doing is finding ways to make it fit in your hand better, right? Whether that's like literally wrapping your hammer's handle in grip tape, or um, uh, taking other steps uh, that um, that. You know, make your kitchen knife, you know, sharpening your kitchen knives to the edge that you like on them, rearranging your pots and pans so that they suit you best, and so on. All of those things that we do um, are, are kind of intrinsic to who we are. That, that you know, when you need, to, when, when you use something regularly, you want it to suit your idiosyncratic needs, not the kind of uh, general broad case that the manufacturer envisioned when they made something that was a kind of one size fits all. And that applies for all of our technology as well. You know, no one is typical. Right? We are all atypical in, in different ways. There's a famous story about the advent of standardized human measurements where uh, uh, someone starts measuring out the uh, arm length and leg length and inseam and chest width of, of people and they arrive at a, a median set of measurements for people and they start making army uniforms in those sizes and they don't fit anyone. <laughs> right? 
uh, that, that uh, averages are a useful analytical tool under some circumstances, but they're incredibly deceptive. And that it's the idiosyncrasies where all of the interesting stuff happens at the margin. It's it's in the experiment. It's in the it's in the things that make you different from other people that allows for the diversity of expression, the diversity of ideas that produces all of the dividends that makes the world great. Right? It's I mean, you love the people you love for the ways that they're different to everyone else, not for the ways that they're same to the same as everyone else. When we think about that. Uh, sort of Going on from that, talking about technology as a form of control, can, can we maybe talk a little bit about copyright? I know it's been a big sort of uh, sure. uh, point for you in recent years, and in, information doesn't want to be free. You mentioned really early on that copyright protection exists not to safeguard creators from being ripped off, but distributors. Can you expand a bit on that? Well, I think that there's a lot of different ways of thinking about copyright. So, you know, in the U.S. context, copyright is explicitly created through uh, a line in the Constitution, what's called the Progress Clause. Congress says, uh, or, or the, the, the framers of the Constitution said, to uh, promote the useful arts and sciences, uh, Congress may grant monopolies of limited times to creators. So, in other words, the thing that we're after is the useful arts and sciences, and a tool that you're allowed, but by no means obliged to use, is a monopoly. And so this sets up this, this constitutional test in the American framework that says monopolies are, are intrinsically evil, but uh, there's sometimes when they're a necessary evil, the times that they're necessary is when creating a monopoly produces more work or more diversity of work than you would get uh, if the monopoly wasn't there. But you should use the smallest monopoly you need to incentivize the work. And then you have the, the Victor Hugo version of this. The, Victor Hugo wrote the Berne Convention, and he said, you know, the, um, the reason for copyright is because of the patrimony that, that when an author creates something, they imbue it with something of their soul, and we should be sure that they are able to control it in some way, that, that they're not unjustly uh, uh, disappropriated of it. But even Hugo had this uh, thing where he said, I don't care whether my heirs inherit my work but I want to make sure that my artistic heirs are able to understand what I intended so they can build on my work in ways that's faithful to my vision, that no one deceives them about what I tried to do by abusing my rights and creating something out of it that uh, has a muddied authorship. So we have this very romantic idea of authorship. But the real politic of copyright is that copyright is primarily the regulatory framework for the entertainment industry. Um, and what the entertainment industry does is it, is it has practices. Some of them are kind of um, folkways, and some of them are laws. And uh, those practices uh, emerge from the different needs of different participants in the supply chain. Uh, people like me who make stuff up, people like my publishers who invest in it, people like the creators of this festival who bring people like me around, people like you who read it, pe people who run bookshops, people who make movies and so on. We come up with this framework that helps us navigate all of the relationships that we have with one another. Just like in finance, we have frameworks for depositors and lenders, for uh, traders, for uh, bond insurers, and so on. And the thing that we use to figure out whether or not this framework applies to you is we um, ask whether or not you are doing something industrial. So in finance, we might say, you're doing something that's part of the finance industry, and therefore in the finance industry's remit, if there's a million dollars involved, there's a million dollars involved, the finance regulator wants a look at. Now, if a pint of beer costs a million dollars more because of hyperinflation, buying a beer for a friend doesn't make you a bank. It means that our test for whether or not you are doing something industrial needs to be revised in light of new reality on the ground. In the entertainment industry, the, the, the proxy we use for whether you are in the entertainment industry is whether you're making or handling a copy of a work. And historically, that was a very good proxy because books always had printing presses in their lineage, movies always had film labs, and so on. But today, we have hyperinflation in copying. You make a thousand copies before breakfast. The way the internet works is by making copies, right? It is not a cunning arrangement of paper towel tubes and mirrors. The only way that a file can, can go from a server to your computer and so you can see the picture or read the words or watch the movie or hear the sounds is if a copy is made, and not just one copy, hundreds of copies as it traverses the internet from there to you. 
And the internet is a single wire that we use to do everything, right? It's the wire that delivers free speech and a free press and freedom of assembly and education and employment and civic and political engagement, all the goods we think of when we think of a civilized society. And to use the framework of the entertainment industry to regulate all of that other activity is a nonsense. Uh, you know, it's a nonsense for lots of reasons, but not least because it's not fit for purpose. If you're, you know, a kid in her mom's basement in rural uh, uh, Queensland writing Harry Potter fanfic, you cannot understand copyright well enough to navigate it and make sure that you're on the right side of the law when you do this. And even if you were like the Doogie Hauser of law, and you got your law degree at the tender age of 12, and you rang up Warner Studios down the block from me in Burbank, California, and said, I would like to take a license for my Harry Potter fanfic, they would hang up the phone on you, right? That is not a thing they do. So if we make something simple enough for that kid to navigate when she writes her Harry Potter fanfic, it will in no way be nuanced and technical enough for Warners to use when it licenses the rights for the Harry Potter theme park ride down the road at Universal Studios. We either make it viable for the entertainment industry or we make it simple enough for everyone else to use. And what we've done is a kind of uh, like bargaining and denial version of this where we just insist that eventually, given enough education, people will understand, understand complex technical bodies of law in order to read. That's never going to happen. If you have to understand the law to read, we're doing something wrong let alone to fall in love, let alone to tell jokes to your friends, let alone to uh, uh, have a political argument. And so I'm all for there being rules in my industry, and I would hope that they were good rules. But even if they're terrible rules, I think the idea that we would apply them to people who aren't in my industry just because they're using a machine that only functions by making copies is a prescription for disaster and brings the whole idea of a framework for my industry into disrepute. It makes it harder for us to have a sensible discussion about what the best rules should be for us to order our affairs within the supply chain of the entertainment industry. What's frightening about the, this industry too is that the punitive nature of the industry whenever people breach what they see as their rules. Um, in your, one of your earlier books, Pirate Cinema, Anthony McCauley's family um, have their internet cut off because he inserts a sex scene into a love story film. And there was some talk in Australia a few years ago about amending the law to cut internet access to those who breached copyright three times. Um, yeah, this, I mean, not just Australia, everywhere, the Hado P law in France and the digital yeah. economy bill in the UK. Uh, if you really want a, an example of how depraved and awful this is, in New Zealand, they proposed Bill 92A, which would have provided for disconnections of, of whole households if one member of that household was accused of you know, watching telly the wrong way three times. And um, it was so controversial that after it was passed in a hurried session of the parliament, there were street demonstrations. And um, it, the government was forced to roll it back. They eliminated the rule. And then after the Christchurch earthquake, there was an emergency sitting of parliament to uh, pass a bill to apportion aid money to dig people out of the rubble of Christchurch. And the MP who had sponsored the bill the first time round said that he would hold up the bill unless the copyright disconnection was reinserted into Australian law as a codicil into the Christchurch relief bill. And that's how it came into law in New Zealand. It's such an act of total depravity. And I think he's a silk now, like he quit, he quit Parliament, but he's still, you know, among, numbered among the great and the good, despite having done this absolutely despicable thing. Um, it is really bad policy to do this, even if we stipulate that watching television wrong is a great sin. It's still wildly disproportionate. There's no way it's that great a sin that we we should kick you off the internet if we think you're doing it. I think we're, we're very acutely aware of it here in Australia because there's so many American TV shows that we just can't watch sure. um, unless you sign up to a million different services. Well, there were repeated studies that showed that there's like literally one way to get people to stop pirating stuff and that's to sell it to them at a reasonable price. Yeah. Right? And, and there's a great natural experiment where NBC boycotted iTunes uh, during a contractual dispute over Christmas holiday when they would expect to sell a lot. And um, iTunes revenue for that went way, way down. 
and uh, use of the Pirate Bay to download MVC products went way, way up. And then when they restored it, uh, the sales went back up again, but people stayed on the Pirate Bay because they finally had the incentive to figure out how BitTorrent worked, and now they were like, you should see what you can get on the <laughs> I had no idea. Well, it, I mean, it's not a very sensible approach to piracy, is it? Because it's copying's not going to go away. Um, sure. Yeah. No. I. I mean, you know, your grandchildren will sit around the table at Christmas, you know, 50 years from now, and say, "Tell me again, Grandpa, how was it that in 2018 you didn't have thumb drives six for a dollar in the checkout aisle at the chemist, each one of which could hold all of the music, all of the movies, all of the words the, through the entire history of human culture that?" You know, we hadn't take all, uh, taken all of the pensioners of the world and, and get re-educated them in libraries to type movie names based BitTorrent into Google. And, you know, like, like tell me again, Grandpa, about when copying was so hard. Uh, it only gets easier from here. You know, if copying gets harder, it's like, that would be like an epiphenomenon of something like a nuclear war, right? Like, other than, uh, uh, short of that, it just gets easier from here on in. Um, we have a gentleman there. Was uh, he seems pretty keen on answering a question? Uh, is that is that why you're there? No, yes, no. I think. Oh, yeah, I think okay. he is. No, no. Well, yes, thank oh, you. Yeah. My question has to do with the first part of your sci-fi yeah, talks, sure. and I imagine you're probably familiar with the writings of Yuval Harari, Sabat, you know, his *Sapiens* and other oh, books. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. Well, it seems there's a scary convergence between what he says is entirely probable with the with the nexus of technologies and what you're saying. Would you, you would you comment on that? Sure, so you know, I think that like the, the best commentary ever on prophecy was in um, the Divine Comedy in, in Dante, where he takes the fortune tellers and he cranks their heads around 180 degrees. He strips them buck naked so they weep down their backs into the cracks of their asses and sets them wading through molten feces while demons flog them. Because the thing about prophecy is it proposes that the future will arrive no matter what we do. And I think that's wrong. I, I wouldn't get out of bed if I thought that was right. I think that science fiction writers are terrible prophets. That if you were to add up all of our predictions, and divide the, uh, divide the number of predictions that came true by that number, you get a number that was pretty close to zero. Uh, you know, we've made a lot of predictions, and if you want to just use survivor bias and just call out the ones that came true, it can look very, very uh, uh, predictive. But if you count in all the ones that didn't, it, it starts to look like we've been throwing darts since Mary Shelley. And, and I think we have been. But what science fiction can do that's unbelievably useful is predict the present. If you take the science fiction stories that resonate in the moment, that people are reading and talking about, what you find out is what our latent fears and aspirations for technology are. Right? That's why we're, we're latching on to them. So when Elon Musk, who is you know this captain of industry, who is building these shareholder-driven corporations that are by law required not to act with regard for humans, in, at large, but only for the shareholders, and if they can uh, commit a crime that generates a million and one dollars and only a million dollar fine, they have a fiduciary duty to commit that crime and return the marginal dollar to their shareholders. When he starts to tell us that AIs are going to take over, that these colony organisms that treat us as kind of their raw material will start to boss us around and they'll get out of our control, I think what he's talking about is like his own latent fear of corporations, right? Like, what is a limited liability? What is a limited liability company except a, a, a you know transhuman immortal colony life form that uses us, uses us as its gut flora? You know. <laughs> so I, I think that like the fact that those stories are chiming tells you a lot about what we're worried about, but not necessarily where we're going. Except to the extent that if you diagnose the present you are telling yourself something about the moving front in which the past is becoming the future. And so it gives you some insight into which direction we're headed and how we might steer it. But not where we're forwarding to go, because I don't think anything is forwarding. Um, Walk Away is a pretty thrilling vision of the future for um, adults to enjoy, but it's probably also worth pointing out that if you have a teenager in your life who spends a lot of time online or in front of a computer or a games console, um, some of Corey's books, Homeland, Pirate Cinema, and Little Brother will be right up their alley. 
Um, and if yourself, if you want uh, a nice clear explanation of copyright, downloading, publishing, surveillance and censorship in the internet age, um, check out Corey's Information Doesn't Want to Be Free, if you want to get up to speed in those matters. Um, that's all we have time for, folks. Um, my name is Chris Flynn. Please thank the gracious and despicably talented Corey Doctor. <laughs> <laughs>